Welcome to episode 19 of the One Small Change podcast. On today's show, we have the founder of Digital Smile Design, Christian Coachman. Christian needs no introduction in the world of dentistry. He's one of the most well-known individuals in the profession. But for our non-dental listeners, Christian is a thinker. He's a communicator. He's an operator. He has this incredible ability to take super difficult and complex topics and reframe and repackage them in a way that makes complete sense. And in today's show, we're going to dive deep into these thought processes that have created such a successful international career and brand. Christian is most well known now for his company Digital Smile Design, which has revolutionized dentistry across the planet, a topic on which he's traveled the world many times over lecturing on. However, before this, he was actually one of the world's top dental technicians, working alongside some of the world's best dentists. And on top of this, Christian is actually dual qualified, so he's qualified as a dentist as well. Uh, And like myself, comes from an incredible lineage of dentists, in his case, spanning back six generations. So I'm super excited to have Christian on the show. Uh, to learn a bit more about the man behind the brand. I know Christian uh, as a friend and as a, uh, as a, an idol of mine personally. So it's a real honor to have you on Christian. Welcome. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, I'm also honored to be here. You know, uh, I have uh, an admiration for, uh, for your uh, still young, but a great career and the work you do. Uh, you know, we, we, we used to meet uh, in, in in-person congresses all, all over the world, and uh, I always appreciated our friendship. So I'm 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 honored to be invited to a, to a show like this. As you were explaining, it's not something that we want to talk about clinical. You want to go a little bit beyond. I love when when we we go beyond dentistry, and uh, I've been seeing some of the great people you've been interviewing. So. You know, I hope I will keep the standards. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you will do. I'm sure you will do. So I, I wanted to start off um, with maybe a bit of a lateral question, but you often post on your social media about coachman family traditions. Um, yes. And I love that. I'm a massive family guy myself. And I mentioned in the intro that you come from a, a lineage of, of, uh, of dentists. And I know family is really important to you. So what does the word tradition mean for you? Yeah, that's actually a great question. You know, we, we, I, I even started, you know, several years ago, this hashtag that I use a lot, the uh, coachman tradition and, and every post, every topic uh, that reminds me of my ancestors, uh, you know, it's for me, tradition, it goes a little bit beyond just uh, uh, family, the existing family, your close family. I love tradition. I, I just love tradition. I love history. I love to understand where we came from. I love rituals. I love people that value rituals. You know, I think that, uh, you know, I, I, I value repeating, you know, things and, and uh, remembering why people were doing this in the past and why we are doing today. And I think it's just beautiful to, to have traditions and to have rituals and connect you with the past. We are so driven into the future. We are always looking into the new things that for me it's a great balance to be uh, mixing innovation and tradition and and every time I think I have a great idea a great new idea or I think I have a cool idea you know I always try to put this in perspective with the past and many times I I see that my idea is not that cool you know when, when you look back and, and you see what people were doing with so much quality without any technology in the past you know so tradition has a lot of meanings for me, but uh, basically, you know, uh, um, you know, I, I, I just love uh, the fact that I was able to learn a lot about my family from the past. You know, I'm, I'm very privileged that uh, many generations, you know, we actually have, I, by coincidence, I actually have a, this book. I didn't have, I didn't prepare this, but we have this book, The Coachman Family. And this actually goes back to the 1500s, and wow. it connects, uh, you know, with the with the royal family in 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 UK, and 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 so people just cared about this in my family, and and they traced the lineage of the coachmans, and then of course the tradition in dentistry. That is something that we are very proud of as well. That's fascinating. Yeah, I think especially as we're both individuals who are very forward thinking in, in dentistry specifically, um, 
But as you say, there's so much that can be learned from, from people of the past. I heard some fascinating research recently that they're showing that actually there's potentially uh, actually uh, elements of thought processes from our ancestors' DNA being transposed into our own DNA. And they've shown this, I think, in, in worms um, that are sort of uh, shocked at the same time as having a flash of light. Um, and then they, they test the, the, uh, the offspring of those specific worms and they they also show a reaction to the to the flash of light, uh, and those that the parent where the parents didn't have the shock, they don't show a reaction. That completely blows my mind. I mean, imagine if your parents, for example, have been through awful traumas like World War Two and the Holocaust and that sort of thing, and how that actually plays a part in your own thought processes moving forward. It's a it's a fascinating um, arena. I- yeah, I totally believe in that. Of course, I, I, I don't have the technical scientific background to say why, but I I, I totally feel uh, myself connected with my ancestors. I feel like uh, my decisions are driven by them uh, or their experiences are affecting my decisions today. Uh, we are building on top uh, generation after generation. Um, I definitely think that my ancestors from somewhere guided me through my most important decisions in my profession. Uh, I love looking at the pictures of my ancestors. I do that all the time here in our office. You know, every important room in the office is named after one of my ancestors, you know. Uh, Brilliant. The the John William Coachman, one of the first dentists, you know, 150 years ago, um, and, and, and everybody after him. So, and every day I walk, I look into their pictures you know I try I try to go back in time and 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 imagine myself sitting and talking to them and learning from them and and it just calms me calms me down it gives me confidence you know it helps me you know digest uh, tough moments uh, so I'm I just feel that I'm constantly learning from them in a more comprehensive way on on a more ritual traditional uh, tradition way you know for example I, I love doing uh, you know, every other day, uh, the dry martini the same exact way that my grandfather used to do. Actually, that my father as a kid used to prepare to my grandfather and my grandmother since uh, they would go back home. They were My grandfather was a dentist and he would go home every day for lunch. And as, arriving at lunch, you know, he would pick the kids at school, uh, drive home, arrive home. Uh, my grandmother was preparing lunch. They would sit down, put some very good uh, jazz music every single day. And my father would then prepare two dry martinis, a slightly different recipe than the traditional, every single day. He would give them the dry martini. They would have the dry martini, have lunch. And then my, fa- my grandfather would drive back and, and work in the afternoon in the office. My father taught me this dry martini recipe. And I... And I do it uh, myself, and and now you know my wife. My wife loves it, and uh, usually Thursday, Fridays, and Saturdays we sit down, we prepare the dry martini on the same way. And every time I do that dry martini, it's like a journey into the past, and I just love that feeling of tradition, you know, of of, of doing things for a bigger reason. Doing for me, tradition is doing things without a pragmatic reason, but for a more um, noble reason for something that goes beyond our understanding that's really beautiful christian yeah i I can see there's i guess it's the connection for you right you feel when you go through that process you're completely present in the moment it's almost meditative um and you you get that it's almost like a a channel through into into your ancestry through all the generations uh in that Mm -hmm. moment it's a really beautiful beautiful thing it, it is a meditation not process yeah I love that. So t- tell us more about your, your early years. You were brought up in Brazil, I believe. Um, and, uh, and obviously you were brought up surrounded by dentistry. Did you always want to go into the profession? Was it something that was expected? Or was it something that you just had a, an innate passion for? Uh, yeah, I was born and raised uh, in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, with a little break when I was from five to seven years old, uh, my father uh, went to U.S. to do his master's on occlusion, Michigan University. 
uh, and we went together. So I lived for two years in US uh, when I was little, me and Francis, uh, while he was doing his masters. Uh, but besides that, my whole, my whole life until I was 30 years old, uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um, uh, I was never into dentistry. I never thought I was gonna be a dentist. I didn't, as a teenager, I never uh, enjoyed talking about dentistry. I never had the, the desire to watch my father work. Uh, I never really visit his office. He was never pushing us or, uh, you know, I got to learn the tradition. He was very laid back and low profile on this matter. And he didn't want to make any kind of pressure. He never really talked about the tradition or things like that. You know, uh, he, he was very humble about it. You know, I actually, after I got into dentistry, you know, he started to tell me all the stories and I got really into it uh, because I love history and he loves history as well. And I, and I kind of even got a little upset with him. It's like, why didn't you explain it all of this, you know, before, and this is so cool. And, and, we started to put all the stories together and so on. Here in the office, we have a wall that, that tells the whole story uh, since 1850, uh, uh, when we had the first dentist in the family. Uh, so I never thought I was gonna be a dentist. I was into design, I was into architecture, I wanted to be an artist or work with something creative and artistic. I always loved uh, drawings. I was very good with my hands, my whole, a young life so that was my dream and my decision of becoming a dentist was a last minute decision in brazil you need to make a a big test to get into the top universities and i applied uh, to the best uh, university in brazil that by the way i have to take this advantage university of sao paulo dental school was just rated uh last month the best dental school in the world uh really wow year. that's amazing so, uh, Something that I never expected. It was always among the top 10 in the world. Uh, we have a tradition there as well, you know, that starts, we are all about to celebrate 100 years of tradition. We have 170 years tradition in dentistry, but 100 years in the University of Sao Paulo since my great uncle uh, uh, got into the University of Sao Paulo Dental School in the 20s, last century. So we're gonna celebrate this in a few years. So we have this tradition, everybody studied there, you know, my grandfather, my great uncle, my father, my uncle, me, my brother, my, my sister-in-law. Um, so at the very, uh, the eve of making the registration of picking your profession, and in Brazil, we don't have college. So you go from high school to whatever school, whatever profession. So at 17, 18, you need to make this huge, I actually don't like this model, I prefer the US model. I agree, yeah. Same here. Years it's, the same, it's the same. Genetic. It's the same in the UK. Who who knows who knows what they want to do when they're sixteen, seventeen? It it, it drives so much, so much yeah. angst for for young people. Yeah. I think being locked into these situations. So at, at at that moment, I had the paper. I could pick architecture. I could pick dentistry. I could pick whatever school. And I, that's one of the moments that I felt my ancestor saying, "Christian, just go here." Don't try to understand why right now you're going to find your passion. You're going to do what you love, even though it doesn't look like uh, just go. And that's what I did. You know, the first few years in dental school were tough because nothing made sense for me. All the basic disciplines were a horrible experience for me because was were completely against what I love, you know, pharmacology, histology, embryology, and all the ologies and, and I was about to quit <laughs> several times. I was about to quit several times. But uh, then uh, for other reasons, I stayed. And then, long story short, this is where I am right now. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, and I, I, while doing my research, it, it brought me back uh, into contact with a lot of your um, technical ceramic work. Uh, for those non-dentists, this is around making... Uh, in essence, in making teeth out of out of porcelain, out of ceramic, um, and the work that you did was just quite simply a, a thing of beauty. Uh, such a talent to be able to recreate nature so accurately, and I know it takes many, many years uh, to get to that level of, of standard. You mentioned before that you you had this this uh, artistic flair. 
when you got into the technical work, did it, did that fall into your hands quite naturally or, or was it something that you had to work hard at? This, actually, I, I, I first need to thank you for this question and your comments. You know why? Because many people know me now and they look at my work, maybe they have a, a, a notion of what I did the last 10 years and many people have no clue about my real work for 20 years as a dental technician that I'm extremely proud of, you know. Uh, people have no clue uh, about this work that I did, about the fact that, you know, I was among the best technicians at, during my time and I was working with the best dentists in the world and I was very proud that that's how I became an international speaker, not because of DSD, this is before DSD, you know, this is on the 2000s, you know, the first decade of our century when I started to lecture about high-end uh, work between dentists and technicians and uh, a lot of peri-restorative integration, but always from the, the perspective of the technician. So I'm very proud of this work. Uh, you know, I don't talk much about it. Uh, and I'm very happy when, when people do some research, look back and say, wow, Christian, he, you were pretty good doing that kind of work, you know. Uh, so thank you for bringing this up. Thank you for giving me these credits because this is the base of everything I do now. You know, DSD only exists because of those 20 years doing a high-end, excellent, uh, comprehensive dentistry with our own hands. You know, there's no technology they can, that can overcome that. There's no way you can use technology properly without having this type of experience and background. So uh, the work of uh, the craftsmanship of working as a technician was something that saved me in the profession. You know, as I said, uh, being a dentist was something that didn't fit with me. And my father actually saved me because during dental school, he told me, you know, Christian, I know you're unhappy. I know you're about to quit. Don't quit. Uh, you know, maybe you can combine your dental school with dental technology school and in brazil you can uh do both simultaneously so i started when i was on the second uh, year of dental school i started dental technology school and uh started to do some work for my father by the way tradition as well because my father started uh, in dental school also working as a technician for my grandfather and my wow, grandfather that's amazing. Also uh, yeah, and my grandfather also during dental school was dent was doing the dental uh, technology, the the lab work for his older brother. So it's like a, a three generation tradition of uh, becoming a technician. Handing over. Dental school. Yeah, yeah, and then moving. You know. So, uh, but the only difference in my case is that when I finished dental school, I decided to not become a clinician that used to be a technician, but I decided to continue to work as a technician, even though I was a clinician. And uh, yes, it, it felt completely natural, you know. Um, I always loved working with my hands and uh, I had a very artistic education, thank God, you know. The school that I went my whole life was very into uh, empowering creativity and, and making you feel um, not afraid of trying and doing things and, and uh, practicing your hands. So it was very natural. I remember in dental school, I started to do all the handwork for all my colleagues. You know, they would even, you know, uh, pay me, say, can you do the, the wax up for me or can you do this for me? You know? <laughs> and, 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 and it was fun. So it saved me. It saved me in dentistry. And do you, do you miss that... Um... Uh, that use of your hands now uh, or are you still actively using them for other artistic endeavors yeah that's a good question you know I, my life has very precise different cycles and moments you know uh and um you know from from believing i was going to be uh uh, a sportsman, you know, when I was a, a teenager and, and gave my life for that. When I became a student and I became a technician and I thought I was going to do that forever. Then a speaker uh, and then I fell in love and, and, and communication is one of my passions for sure. 
then the business development side that I'm in right now. And honestly speaking, I'm very honored of each one of these. And I know that each one is helping me to be what I am today. But I don't have the sensation of, oh, I wish I was still doing this or that. No, I don't miss because there's so much happening right now that there's no time to miss anything just to keep moving forward and, and use the experience from the past to become the best on this new moment. So no, I, I don't miss, you know, of course, sometimes I feel like, oh, maybe I can sit in the bench again and, and build up some ceramics and, and, but then, you know, there's so much going on that I just, you know, don't have the time, you know, maybe when I, I'm older and everything slows down, I will be able to go back and do more with my hands again. I love that. Yeah. It, it, I, I love that, uh, that about your career in that you refuse to accept a pre-existing label and you allow yourself the the openness to move into a new chapter in your life um it's something that i relate to strongly as well with regards to in some ways being a dentist and then being a speaker and then now it's in a similar way to you uh, but very different in other ways going into business development with parlor and, and with my toothpaste brand and stuff do you find that, um, or did, did did you find with you with yourself that those transitional periods um, just naturally uh, allowed for a gradiated movement between the different chapters, or was there sort of stark decisions that you had to make between the chapters where you were like, and I imagine this was the case with the technician piece, right? I have to stop being a technician now if I'm going to move on to this next chapter. Like, how did how did you make those decisions? Yes, it's uh, it, it actually happened in a very uh, natural way. It wasn't like one day I made a decision, but one thing started to grow as the other thing was still happening. Uh, so each stage, uh, each phase was transitioning in a very uh, tranquil way without, without having to make a, a big decision in one moment. So... As I was working as a technician, I realized that I loved, I loved teaching. You know, this is uh, something that I have inside of me because since I was a, a young technician, even though I didn't know much, I remember always trying to understand the process of why I was uh, doing something better or why I was not being able to do something better. So everything that I was getting good at, I was always not just taking it for granted or focusing to do more of it or just focusing on on the money that I was doing with it. On output, I was always, yeah. I, I was questioning myself, okay, I'm doing this very well. Hmm, interesting, because one year ago I was not doing this very well. What happened on the last year that made me become good at this? What was the, the psychological process, the technical process, you know, what did I do to become good with that? How can I structure this process so I can share with others? How can I organize this in a bullet in bullet points? You know, how can I uh, create a methodology to teach my uh, colleagues that are working with me to do this one thing that I'm doing pretty well that maybe they're not doing as well as myself? And with that, how can I also use this this strategy to learn faster what the other one is doing better than me. So I was always creating didactic strategies about everything that I was doing. So naturally, you know, I started to teach even at a young age, you know, I was teaching things and I was always listening, learning, connecting dots. And, and something very common was that even people that were doing things better than me, they would come to me as a Christian is amazing because you can explain better than myself what I do very well. You know, when I try to explain what I do, I don't explain as well as you do, you know? So can you please help me explain why I'm good at this? So, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and this was naturally also became my second job with the international speakers and dentists that I worked, you know, since they were all speakers, they were not hiring me just because I was a good technician. They were hiring me as well to help them build the stories of their lectures, to build the outline of their lectures, to build uh, the script of their lectures, the, the layouts, you know, the, the visual communication education process of uh, 
powerful lecture. Yeah, and that is such an art. Um, and I think what you've described there is this analytical thinking that I described in the intro. Um, but the interesting crossover, I guess, with you is that you've got that analytical thinking brain, but then you mix that with an artistic flair. And I think that's what comes across so nicely in your um, in your decks and your presentations is that the the data the the information is presented in such a clear way, but it's it's overlaid with with beautiful artistry at the same time, and I think that's a real special uh, skill set. And I think that's a really interesting point in general, where where you have two skills and you combine them together, that's where the real sweet spot is because you you become invaluable at that at that intersection. Maybe, maybe you know, I think uh, art is definitely a powerful educational tool, you know, because. Uh, it helps keep the attention of people. Uh, it helps tell a story. So, you know, art, design, and education and teaching, when you can combine these things, you know, uh, but you have to combine because I see a lot of beautiful lectures that have very poor teaching outcomes. Mm. And I have great teaching, uh, educational lectures that have very poor uh, artistic uh, outcomes. And I think the best lectures is when you you use art for a reason, you know, visual communication for a reason, not just to show off, not just to impress people, but you use art and, and everything has a reason to look the way they are, to be designed the way it is. And the reason needs to be to help whoever is sitting in front of you to, to take a more solid message back home. Yeah. I love that. And there's definitely a lot there for me to take to my own, um, my own lecturing style, I'm sure. Um, so let, let's talk a bit about digital smile design then. Um, I'd love to hear about um, the founding of that uh, company, where the idea came from and, and why you think it's so important, especially for listeners who maybe haven't heard of the concept before. So digital smile design today is a company, but it started just as a concept, as a bunch of ideas that I had basically because of my dual training, you know, dentist and technician. So I saw the problems uh, that were happening uh, when two, two team members were trying to work together. And basically I was seeing the, the, the problems, the limitations, the mistakes that we were doing. I was seeing the, the waste of time, energy and money on things that could be improved, processes, you know, basically processes. So I, I was always into processes, you know, why do we do this the way we do? Just because we learn, you know, people usually don't question things and they just do things the same way just because that's the way I do. And if they are making decent money with it, they're just on their comfort zone and they can spend their whole life doing things in a very similar way. I, I was never like that, you know, I'm not saying I was better or worse. I'm just, I was never like that. You know, the status quo was not something attractive to me. I was like, challenging myself and challenging the ways of doing things and and trying to find better ways and that's how the first idea of dsd started in 2008 you know i started to put together things and because i love teaching i was explaining you, know, you, you want to understand why my lecture looks good why these great doctors are working with me it's because i work like this you know i i created this documentation protocol i use the the PowerPoint keynote as a dental software, and I do these drawings, I make these measurements, I guide my wax ups, facially driven wax ups, you know, comprehensive guided dentistry, and all these principles started to come together, um, and it became a course in 2009. Uh, and for many years, DSD was just me with my course. And in 2014, uh, in 2014, we partnered up with a company here in Madrid, and we became a company that not only was serving dentists with courses, but started to provide services for them to implement the ideas after the courses. So we said, you know, I was teaching DSD for already five years. People loved the course, but very few people were doing something with the course ideas, you know? So I did a little research and I realized that People were loving the course, but not doing, you know, things with the ideas from the course. You know, this is this is not what I want. You know, I just don't I don't want to just show off on stage. I, I want my ideas to have an impact. So I started to think about what can we do after the course? You know, 
uh, create a team to support the doctor to implement the ideas. You know, that's how the DSD planning center started. That's how the DSD lab started. And that's how the DSD marketing agency started as uh, three pillars to support the doctor that liked the ideas and said, okay, Christian, I need help after the course. How can I implement this? And today we have a whole process of implementation and training and consultancy and in-house training, empowering the staff, preparing the staff. So it's a complete philosophy today of how to manage a modern smile rehabilitation clinic. I love that. Yes. Uh, 2014, I think, was the, uh, the year that I did the DSD course um, in Luxembourg at the Violife Clinic. Yes. Um, yes. So, uh, yeah, that was my, my first exposure to it. Um, and it's been a, a key part of my, my own clinical career since then, really. Um, you mentioned there that you've got these three pillars. You've got it's, DSD has, has now, as you say, gone from this concept into such a broad, um, diverse business. How do you how do you maintain control of that as the leader of that ship um, whilst maintaining the culture and the standards and all of those sort of things? Is there anything that you can speak to that could help um, entrepreneurs and businessmen, as most of us are in the dental field, uh, in guiding their own maybe slightly smaller ships? <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, that's a great question. I don't have a business background at all, so it, it has been the last you know, 10 years, an amazing learning experience for me. But uh, thank God, I, I always, you know, I always knew that the shortcut to success is to have great mentors, you know, to connect and learn from great people, you know, to listen, to be a, an eternal beginner, to keep your beginner's mind. So uh, I didn't get stuck into the great speaker role and I'm just a great speaker, you know, I, I I saw the opportunity to, to help more dentists by creating a business and I started to listen and spend my time much more with uh, smart business people than smart dentists. You know, I said, okay, now this is where I need to learn more. So um, I don't have this background, I'm learning, but I can tell you that regardless of how much business background you have, you know, it's all about leadership. You know, it's not about the background and it's not about what you study. It's about the vision and the leadership and the humbleness. I, I call it the humble confidence. For me, the combination, the most powerful combination in, in a professional. Uh, humble confidence of or confident humbleness. These two things together can take you anywhere, you know, if you're genuinely humble. But not pretending, but really humble. And you behave like that and you think like that and you, you act for real as a humble person, but not humble enough to make you weak, not humble enough to make you submissive. Humble to keep you grounded, but at the same time you mix with amazing confidence, you know. You need to be confident. And, but confidence by itself, it can become arrogant. So that's why you need the, the humbleness. So humbleness and confidence, uh, you know, when I see people with those things, I think that they have the whole potential to run any kind of business. And then the other thing is team building, you know, uh, becoming a master on attracting the right people. It's, uh, and attracting the right people means if you want to develop a project, you need smart people and you don't know everything. And, and people like I, me, you don't know a lot of things on the business side. So you better be very good attracting very good people. But how can you attract very good people? You know, you need to be a master on creating purpose. So smart people come to you. You know, the average people, you can, everybody can attract every, average people. But very, very smart people, they're willing to give up on their own dreams to join you on your dream. That level of people that you need to succeed only if you become a master on inspiring and creating a bigger purpose and genuinely making people understand that this project goes beyond myself. This project uh, can make your dream come true. Your career can be generated inside this project. Only then, you know, very smart people will join. And then the final one is delegating, you know, being very confident confident 
and comfortable delegating, uh, not over controlling things, not being stuck on perfection and just allowing things to happen and, and making people comfortable to try to make mistakes, to continue, to allow them to start leading their own processes and you become just this guide that is always side by side, not from the top to the bottom, but side by side, helping the teams to move forward. I mean, so so many takeaways there. I love that. I love the beginner's mind. Um, and uh, yeah, humble confidence is, again, is, is something that I think, I think the humbleness there really comes down to respect as well. I think that's where, where confidence can become uh, unruly and, and unhelpful is where you lose that respect factor because no one, you can't work with people without, without a, a level of respect. And, and there's many ways of showing that respect, both verbal and, and nonverbal and in the way that you carry yourself and, and the way that you behave. And I think that's something when I first met you in person was really quite, um, it took me back because again, when you see someone with such confidence on the stage, you assume there's going to be an element of arrogance about them when you, when you meet them in purpose uh, in, in person, sorry. Um, but actually there was none of that. And I think that's a really, um, it's a really important discussion point, especially for younger dentists or, or younger individuals trying to make their way in a profession. I know that I have been uh, labeled with a stigma of arrogance in my earlier years and probably still now, um, but by people who don't know me. And, and I've always tried to, to practice humbleness and, and respect because that's the way I was brought up by my again it comes back to the lineage and back to the traditions and the family um, but my dad's favorite quote is is manners maketh man um, and uh, that's something that's always really stuck stuck with me um, and then I think it's quite difficult when people don't treat you with the same respect that's where it can create tension um, certainly for me that's that's for me the best compliment I have to be honest when when somebody comes to me and say, and say, you're so humble. You know, for me, that's the number one best compliment I can get, you know, because I'm constantly looking at myself to control my ego, understand that I have an ego, that we all have an ego, that if mm. you are a speaker and you like to be on stage, that means that you probably have an even bigger ego <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, and there's no problem. There's no problem. The problem that I see, it's a shame for me to see so many great guys out there, good friends, you know, great professionals that lost their humbleness and even worse, that don't even see it. You know, they really think that uh, they're not arrogant, you know, that they are not uh, bossy, that they are not, they, they lost this connection with the humbleness and, and the beginner's mind and how small we are and how insignificant is even our best ideas and, and all these things. And how many people, they just say it because it's cool to say it and they don't really li live it and they don't even incorporate this. It's a shame for me because, uh, you know, I see a waste of talent out there when the ego takes over and it destroys so many beautiful things. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think that whole concept of realizing that you're actually not important at all and, and taking a, a full zoom out to the entirety of the universe and then looking back in on yourself at, at the small impact that you're making is one of the most powerful things that especially business leaders can do because naturally, if you run a successful business or you have a successful career, as you've mentioned before, it forces you into a high ego position. Um, but actually, that's the worst condition that you can be in for your own mental health, if nothing else, like for your own personal well-being. Um, uh, Urquhart Tolle talks about the ego in, in a slightly different way in his book, Power of Now. Um, but it's a similar it's a similar concept. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a really powerful tool, I think. I have an exercise that I do, you know, quite often is that when I, whenever I start to feel like I'm too cool, <laughs> I, I start to make fun of myself, you know, and I do it very often. It's something internal with myself. Whenever I start to feel like I'm too cool, I, I, I start to make fun of myself and I do the exercise of, of 
of not taking myself too seriously, you know, not taking my achievements or uh, not taking everything that looks so important too seriously. And that brings me down to her very, very fast. Mm. I love that. I love that a lot. And I think I think probably a lot of people have had that forced upon them in the last year with the pandemic. Um, and there's been a, a big reframing, I'm sure, for a lot of people to focus more into actually what's important in my life. Is it how much money I'm making or how successful I am or, or these material um, not real things? Or is it actually the relationships that I've built or how I can help other people? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Talking of, of improvement and talking of careers, um, I know, uh, and you mentioned it a little bit here yourself, that you dentistry clinically itself wasn't really for you. And, and that's how you found the technical aspect of it. I know I've got a lot of friends. I'm, I'm about 10 years qualified now. I've got a lot of friends who have left the profession or uh, have had mental health issues because of the profession and they don't enjoy the profession. Um, I've heard you talking before about the three P's for finding pleasure and, and meaning in work. And uh, I'd, love, I'd love for you to tell our listeners a bit more about these and, and how we can implement them in our own careers to, um, to drive, yeah. I guess, satisfaction. Uh, maybe that's the wrong yes. term, but you can, yeah. you, you can say it better than me, I'm sure. Life is short, man. You, we need to enjoy every minute. And we, we need to be very pragmatic sometimes. We need to make changes. We need to give up on things and, and move into different things. You know, it's never too late. Dentistry is um, a very tough profession. But the problem is that, you know, we always have the sensation, I don't like what I'm doing, I'm tired, I'm going to move. But then the problems come with you and you're tired again with the other thing, you know. So, uh, and this, I had this aha moment, um, basically analyzing my father that does dentistry for 50 years and he's working more than ever today. And I'm always concerned that his health, you know, and he's in great shape, but we are like, dad, slow down. And then he said, no, I love this, man. <laughs> and I'm doing more and more. He yeah. works on Saturdays, you know, he works on Saturday seeing patients and, and amazing. Uh, and he was teaching me, you know, that the thing you, you need to, you need to uh, feel so good doing something that this is, you know, it's kind of even cliche, you know, make your job become a hobby and then you will never work again. All these blah, 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 blah. That is the, the real truth, you know, but it becomes cliche and blah, blah, blah. If you don't go a little bit deeper and start to understand how can you make this magic happen, you know? And I started to, you know, think about how my father is working as a clinician for 50 years. And most of my friends that are working for 20 years are already giving up or trying to find different things to do, you know? And that's when, you know, I came up with the three Ps and I, and I realized that what makes us all love what we do is when we are able to keep our passion about it, our pride on what we do and our performance. You know, if you start dropping the performance, uh, you, you lose, uh, you know, the motivation to do what you do when you feel like, Oh, you know, I'm not the same anymore. You know, um, when you, it's like a, a an athlete, you know, you, I'm going to give up, you know, you start to go down, I'm going to give up because I'm not the performance at the same level i'm not performing at the same level but the 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 thing about the performance is not about comparing yourself to others it's about being the best you can at the moment and and being excited about learning the new things of the moment to perform better in the moment you know so uh, the performance is very important that you need to refresh yourself reinvent yourself be connected to younger people and and learn and incorporate things, you know, and this happens a lot on the DSD course where I have doctors that are 60, 70 years old, about to retire, and they come to the course and they're like, my God, I wish I came to the course 20 years ago, or I was about to retire and now I feel empowered. I want to work 10 more years with full power. And, and that's amazing for me to see these super already successful dentists about to retire, coming to our courses and say, God damn it, I'm going to do this for 10 more years. This is amazing. So that That's is great. performance. Right? That's performance. You need to be connected and, and feel excited about changing something. And my best mentor there was 
Dr. Ronald Goldstein, that today he's almost, I don't know, I think he's almost 90. And I had the honor, honor to work side by side with him for five years when I was working with Team Atlanta. And his passion, his desire to learn when he was like 75, 80 years old, one of the most well-known names in dentistry, a revolutionary, a guy that needed to do nothing more in our profession. He was in the lab on a Friday evening with me over my shoulder as a young student looking at me and saying, but why do you do this like this? No, 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 show me, teach me. No, no, that's so cool, you know. Let me try it. Love well. it, that's amazing. At 80 years old, okay, this is somebody that is combining the three Ps. You know, passion, pride, and performance, you know. So, you know, passion is about uh, finding this pleasure of doing what you do over and over again. And by reinventing yourself to keep the passion and always believing you're just starting, just starting every year again and again, you know. The pride is a lot about creating purpose. You know, if you just do dentistry, just to do dentistry, you're going to lose the three Ps, you know. Now, to feel proud of what you do, what you do needs to have a bigger meaning. And many times as a dentist, uh, our bigger meaning is not big enough. You know, oh, I'm just going to do an amazing full mouth rehabilitation. It's going to be by the book. It's going to be great. That is not enough. You know, you need to exercise the bigger meaning of what you're doing. The bigger meaning for your life, your personal bigger meaning. Why doing this? Why giving my best for just one more patient after 20 years doing this? Why giving me my best right here, right now uh, will bring me a bigger meaning that will make me more proud, you know? Why what I do is meaningful to the people that work with me you know that's one of the best ways to create fulfillment and create pride is to see that your work is bringing a lot of people together and and that your business your clinic is being the home for these people that these people actually want their build their lives based and around your little small clinic whatever that you think it's just one more clinic and you look around and, and you are able to be this leader to, to really feel people belong and own the decisions and own the results and, and, and look into the future. And you see that suddenly you have five employees and all the five are looking at themselves in 10 years and still believing they should be working with you. And nobody is doing plan B's and C's and everybody's there. This creates such a fulfillment and pride, you know, that that boosts you, that it's, it's uh, uh, get, uh, energy for working 10, 20, 30 more years if you keep that uh, m meaningful uh, reason, relationships, and so on. So I believe that um, this is the exercise. You know, every single day you need to ask yourself why I'm passionate about what I'm doing. Am I passionate about how can I become more passionate? Not, it's not changing professions that will solve the problem, you know. It's uh, finding the ways to be more passionate than creating deeper meaning for you, your team, and the patient to be more proud and being an eternal student to reinvent yourself and keep the performance going. Yeah, the beginner's mind comes back in again into that piece, I think, doesn't it? Um, I, think, I think what you said about, um, about finding uh, passion and fulfillment from supporting others within your team is something that definitely resonates with me I, my parents were both dentists and uh, they bought the practice just before i was born um and a lot of the team that are there now were there when my parents took over the clinic um and having that integral to the the ethos and the the structure of the building and the and the and the business i think just gives me so much more it may, it, I guess it gives me so much more responsibility in many ways because, as you say, you're you're, you're creating a. I haven't created it. I I, I now mm -hmm. have to guide the but ship responsibility on. Responsibility gives pride. Responsibility gives pride. You know, if you yeah. do if you're doing something and you don't feel any responsibility, you have no skin in the game. And yeah. without skin in the game, 
you're not proud of what you're doing. You know, when you when you make a decision as the owner of your office, and you know that your decision will affect everybody that works with you, that makes you proud of yourself, of your decision, and that is energy for you to keep doing. Yeah, and I think that accountability as a leader is probably one of the most important things. You can't if you if you practice your business as a with a blame culture. Um, oh, you've you've done this wrong, and so you should be reprimanded for it, uh, as opposed to actually looking internally and saying, right, well, I hired that person and I set up the framework for them to work within. So actually, it's probably my fault. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's such a better way to to guide a, especially a very small, close knit community like a like a dental practice or a small business of that sort. Yeah, I think the, but on top of all, the thing that gives us more energy to keep doing is the sensation that you're learning, the sensation that you're learning. So, uh, you know, we need to find ways to provoke ourselves, to question ourselves, to challenge ourselves, you know, and to keep learning. And the same for our team as well. My, my treatment coordinator came in to me uh, yesterday and she said, oh, I've just, I found this course. It's on, uh, it's on treatment coordination and, and implant treatment coordination. Can I, can I do it? It's, it's this amount of money. And I was like, Jem, you don't even need to ask me. Like the answer is always going to be yes to that question. You want to, you want to develop yourself. You want to improve yourself for yourself and for the, for the team and for the business. Of course, I'm going to support that. It doesn't matter how much it costs. Yeah. Yeah. It's no, super sure. important. I think yeah. Yeah. brilliant. So, um, we are getting to the, the end of the time that we've got together. Um, and, um, I, uh, I, one of the, the big focuses I have on, on, um, on this show is, is failure. Um, and you've described such a, a wonderful career, um, with, with so many massive astronomical successes. Uh, but what I've tended to find with, with a lot of our guests is actually it's the failures that have had the biggest impact on their progression. And they've, they've, I always say you can't succeed your way to success. You have to fail your way to success. Could you could you elaborate on on potentially one of your bigger success, uh, bigger bigger failures? Sorry, sorry, and what you've learned from it. Mm -hmm. um, I agree. You know, we all know the importance of failures, and uh, that success is not as easy as it looks like on Instagram. Um, and in my in my story, you know, it wasn't. Uh, big failures, but s s constant small failures, you know, and, and the failures in my case are much more related to not getting the results that I expected, you know, in many mo in certain moments in my career, I thought that, oh, this, this is the idea. This is going to kill it. You know, now I nailed it, you know. And, uh, you know, and then you implement, you put energy, resources, and you say, now we're going to make a lot of money with this, blah, blah, blah. And, and then after a few months, after a year, you know, nothing really happens, you know. And, the, and my growth in terms of, of, of pro professional know-how and in terms of profit and income has been a very constant, solid, slow organic growth year after year regardless of how many great ideas i thought that i was going to make a lot of money in one shot um you know i realized many times that my ideas are not necessarily as good as i thought or that they don't have a, a, a business impact the way i imagine and i learned to stop to be being frustrated with not being like many business uh, men, uh, men out there, businessmen out there that did something. One idea, boom, launched and poof, and that is possible and it happens. But I believe that um, that's the reason why I don't like to read biographies of all these super successful people because never a story will fit to the other and these lessons are very not very relevant you know you know learning you know trying to understand how successful people made a lot of money or were successful 
I may be wrong, but in my opinion, it doesn't help you that much, you know. It's much better for you to try to look inside yourself and, and, and find your, your purposes and your differentials, your best version, and, 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 and customize the strategy to yourself. So in my situation, I, 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 I had to learn that probably, you know, I'm going to be like this, step by step, step by step. And, and it's not like one amazing idea and a lot of money will come. So I invested a lot, a lot of energy on, and that generated a lot of frustration because these things didn't happen. And today I'm just much more calm, much more uh, uh, in, in harmony with the fact that um, it's day after day, it's constant hard work, it's just uh, keep the light at the end of the tunnel, keep moving on the direction that you believe. And, you know, uh, and success is not anymore fame or, or fortune. <laughs> success for me is happiness and health. And, um, and I try to focus on that and let the world do the rest. Yeah, a brilliant note to end on. And I, th I think what you've said there is that you're basically giving your, firstly, you're starting. And I think a lot of people send me messages saying, um, how have you done what you've done with Parler? Um, we were, I, I'm thinking about starting something myself, but I don't know where to begin. Uh, and my answer to those people is always just start, just get something out and then iterate and reiterate and develop on the go. Because as you rightly say, you can read Shoe Dog by Phil Knight till you're, till you're blue in the face. It doesn't mean you're going to create the next Nike. You have to create your own story and, and to do that you've got to as you said before be in the game you've got to have skin in the game but then at the same time you have to give yourself the space and the kindness to to not uh, berate yourself if things aren't successful and I know for one I'm not very good at that myself <laughs> but um Christian I know I know you've got to get off um I just want to ask you one last question which is the question we asked to everyone on the show which is what is the one small change that you've made in your life which you wish you had made earlier Learn to say no. Yeah, very powerful. Too many, too many ideas, too many opportunities. And you, you go like this. And then it's hard to make uh, one thing work very well. So you need to say no, you know, in an elegant, elegant, hum way. humble way. <laughs> in a humble, confident way. Say no. This is Brilliant. my plan. This is my path. I love that. Value-led decision-making. Perfect. Well, Christian, thank you so much for your time. That was, uh, that was brilliant. Absolutely fascinating. So many, so many great tips that I'm certainly going to take away myself there and implement into my own, my own life and my own businesses. Um, thank you so much. I can't wait to, to see you again in person soon, uh, hopefully yes. at, at a dental conference somewhere around the world. Yeah, um, it will happen soon. <laughs> in, in, exactly. Brilliant. Thank you so much. See you next time. It's, it was my pleasure. Thank you. And I uh, hope to see you soon as well.